verse 41 of Luke chapter 19. And I want you to be thinking about how Jesus really felt. I preached on this not very long ago, but not from this angle. It says, And when he, that is Jesus, was come near to the city of Jerusalem, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. Um, evangelism is very misunderstood in, in a whole lot of ways. Uh, but almost every truly born-again Christian at least has a foundational understanding that evangelism means to reach people. It means to reach out to people, to try and bring them to a place of saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, far too many of us aren't actively evangelizing. Now, I'm going to be giving you some things um, that I hope is going to hit you, but, I, you know, the most recent thing for me was uh, in Sam's class, that's been three or four weeks ago, I suppose, something like that, and he brought a lesson on missed opportunities. Every day, our day, is filled with opportunities. And I'm sure that every one of us today, as much as we don't want that to be, we missed some opportunities. And, and probably in each and every day that goes by, we miss opportunities. But that really stayed on my heart and my mind for several weeks. I gave out more, more tracts during those several weeks, witnessed to more people during those several weeks, and for one primary reason, something was given to me, and it turned out to be a Sunday school lesson, that made me continuously aware of what was going on. My, my concern was heightened dramatically. That's what I'm hoping is going to happen. For the message I bring tonight and on Sunday morning, what Brother Jeremy is going to be bringing also, that God will speak to our hearts. Because the bottom line for me is that I really believe Bible Baptist Church truly cares about people. I really do believe that. Now, we, we may not be real good about showing that sometimes, but I think it's true. I think I could go down these aisles and go to every single person, and every one of you would have been just like me since I used him on Sunday as an example, Huey. I haven't been able to get up there this week, and so I haven't done any news on him. But, but uh, Huey was a guy, and, and what attracted me to him was his pain. God was suffering dramatically. And I would venture to say that any one of you, if you had been in my situation where there was a Huey there, a little short black Jamaican guy, or at least down in the Caribbean, I don't know if he's Jamaican or not, but he, this guy was in desperate pain, hurting dramatically. And I was frustrated by it. And it seemed to help when I sat down by him and put my arm around him and prayed with him. And it seemed like just somebody being there to help share the burden. It seemed to help him some up. You would do that. I'm without my mind that there's not a person in here that if you had someone who was suffering one way or another, you would reach out to them. At least I wouldn't believe that. And I don't think it's founded on anything that's false. I really believe you would. But in our text here that I've just read to you, it doesn't really come across with what Jesus was doing. Because this, I really believe this is the foundation of all. I'm thinking about the... Um, I'm thinking about Alan. He's home now. I'm right about that. And he lives in Belek. Am I right, Sam? Come to church Sunday. Praise the Lord. Um, why, do you, why do you think Sam went and visited him? I know why. I want, I'm just trying to get your attention on this. I'm, I'm not, this is a simple outline I'm going to give it and really easy stuff, but I, I, I really need your attention. I don't have a doubt in my mind that he was doing that because he was concerned about this guy. He worked for him. Um, I think it was Ben, am I right? It was Ben and it was Jordan, I think, got their Bibles and made a determination they liked this guy so much that they were going to go down to Somerset when he was in hospital and witness to him and lead him to Christ. It's two teenage boys who wanted to do that. I don't know if that touches your heart at all, but it touches me. What were you saying? Did you say something about that? Amen? Good. That really touched my heart. I don't think they got to see him, but that's not the point. They went. They went. And that's what matters. Now, I'm going to be doing this right along through here, and believe me, this message is not to make any of us feel bad. Because honestly, I think we're all in the same boat. I, 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 I'm going to bring out about seven things I'm going to be bringing to your attention. But I want you to see Jesus here. You've got the Son of God who knows everything that's going to happen before it happens. He understood exactly where he was at in time. He knew exactly what he was going to be doing. And yet when he comes down into Jerusalem, instead of that being a triumphal entry, as many would say that it is, it was a tearful entry. Luke 19.41 says that he wept over the city. 
Now, what comes to your mind when you hear the word weep? What comes to my mind is I see a person sitting there and they're crying, gently crying. That's what I see. See, I see Jesus on this little white donkey, this little colt, coming down and the tears are running down his face. But that wasn't it at all. And I'll tell you how I know that. A.T. Robertson was probably the greatest Greek scholar of this side of the Atlantic Ocean. And he, he gives us something in his word pictures. And here's what he tells us about it. The word wept is the Greek word epilosin. It's an aggressive, aorist, active, indicative. Now, I only put that in there so you think I was smart. I don't even know what that means. But I put it in there because he says that means it has to be this. Jesus didn't just sob a little bit. He burst out loud into tears. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that experience in your life or not, where something just exploded on you. I'm, I'm using that figuratively. Where you were so impacted by an event that happened that you just burst out with tears. That's exactly what Jesus did. He, is, he goes on to give a description, and he said, more than likely what was going on is, as he looked at the city, the pressure began to build up inside of him because he knew what was going to happen. A Roman general by the name of Titus was going to be coming in not very long after this in 70 AD and literally wipe out the, the, the city of Jerusalem, tear it totally down to the ground with the exception of the wailing wall we see today. Because he saw that, but that wasn't even so much the reason. I'm going to get into that reason in just a moment, but I want you to see what was going on with him. He was so deeply burdened that he exploded into emotion when he began to think about the city. Now, I, I think you're getting the point of this. For, do I even, you even need to ask this question? Did Jesus care about the lost? Oh, far deeper than we're even capable of. I have no doubt in my mind about that. And I want you to stop and think about yourself. And, and I, I, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. It's just I think it's the place that we're at. And I think it will do us good. To admit to ourselves without turning around and saying, talking about me, so you don't need to do that. But I want you to let the Holy Spirit of God put in your mind what the answer to this is. Do you truly care about people and their souls? Now reflect on that. Because Jesus gives us the perfect example. The Apostle Paul gives us a perfect example. Do you remember what he said? He said, he said oh, oh, Israel, Israel. Um, he says to them that he would have been willing to go to hell for them if they would have only turned to him in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 3, chapter 9, and then a few verses in Romans chapter 10. He talks about his burden. I wish I could wish myself cursed. That's what he, the way that he put it. And that simply means that he would have gone to hell for them. And, and I'm going to tell you something. When I stop and think about people like that, that I would be willing to even make that statement about and really mean it, could you even mean that and talk about anybody? I, mean, I, think, I, I think I could say that for you. you know, I mean, what sense does that even make to begin with? She said, it's easy for me to stand here and say that I'd be willing to go to hell for her, because that's just not going to be a reality. I don't even know if we can measure that. I'm, I'm trying to let God measure my own heart and what He wants to do with me. But I have, I have no doubt in my mind that it is connected to Jesus Himself and what motivated Him. He looked at the city. He looked at the people. And I want to tell you something. These people were more religious than we will ever be in our life. I mean, if you knew the habits of the Jewish people of that day, and you knew how they sacrificed in the way that they did, stop and think about people around the world. Catholics in particular in foreign countries, and I'm forgetting where that exact place is at, where they, they crawl on their knees, bloody their knees, and crawl all the way up these stairs to get to some statue where they can worship. And I might look at that and shake my head and say, that's a pity. But think of that. I mean, somebody that would be willing to do that, they've got some depth to them, and it may be misdirected, but they really care about something. It's deep down in their heart. And so for Jesus, he's looking at these people that are so religious. And when he looks at them, he realizes they don't have a personal relationship with me. Most religious people in the world, they don't know God. Now, I'm saying that because we're about to get into the message here. 
But I'm saying that, you, is it possible that Jesus, if he appeared to us today, would he say that to us? Would he stand before Bible Baptist Church and weep? And say, here are the people that are the most religious people in this county. They don't even know me. And I'm saying you're lost. No, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm just saying that something's wrong. Something's very wrong, and it's really hard to evaluate. That's our first point. We are going to evaluate it. I've got seven things that I want to bring to your attention. And I think, I think that if you'll allow this, this will help us to, to, be, to uh, analyze ourselves in any witnessing ministry that we may have in our life or would like to have in our life. Now, the seven questions that I'm going to ask you, there, there are answers to these, but really, you're the only one that can answer to you. Here's the first one. Do you believe that God wants you to be personally involved in evangelizing people? There's a follow-up question that I'm going to have, because there are people who believe that only people who have the gift of evangelism, the Bible talks about that, that they're the only ones that should, should be doing that. Uh, what about the gift of giving? Doesn't the Bible talk about the gift of giving? Am I right about that? It does. Does that mean only people that have the gift of giving should be givers? Doesn't mean that at all. Because the Lord has taught us very clearly in His Word that we're all to give 10% of what, what He has blessed us with. Showing that we understand that He's the one who's the giver of it. And we're living in obedience to Him, so we're going to give that 10%, at least that 10% back. So it can't be that. It cannot be that. Because the commission that was given was given to the entire church. Now, given... The truth is that the entire church back in that day uh, was right there in, in the first chapter of Acts. It's when, when Jesus was uh, still walking upon the earth, there was only 12 apostles. Only 12 of them. That was the first church. And he gave that commission to that first church. And so when I say to you, do you believe that you personally should be involved in evangelizing people? You really need to answer that for yourself. Just be yes or no. And I'm not putting you on the spot and saying, and saying, then why don't you? Because every one of us could have that thrown at us. I mean, just look at today. How many people did you evangelize today? That, that is my use of a very broad term. How many people today did you attract to? Uh, don't answer. Uh, how many people did you say, hey, I'm going to invite you to church? My wife is great about that. And the bank is great about it for her. I don't, I don't really know we didn't talk much about this, but I know that so many times that people's names have come to say, oh, I'm glad to the church. And she seems to do that, at least just from talking with her. It seems like she does that on a regular basis. I would imagine Ron Shaw uh, working for you, and you're his boss, I suppose, in one sense of the word, because you're in the company. But he's, I, I don't think I know about Ron. He, he talks to everybody about the Lord. Whether he's selling property or whatever he's doing, he does it. Do you? And, and the question really would be, do you think God wants you to do that kind of thing? Now, I'm not saying it has to be in a certain way. When I'm talking about, do you believe that God wants you to be personally involved in evangelizing, it may not be in some of these outward ways that I'm talking about. You couldn't be a Ron Shaw, or you couldn't be whoever, but you, you have been called to evangelize. And if you can look at today and say there was nothing, and you can look at last week and say there was nothing, last year and the year before that, and say there's nothing, then at least this is true. If you do believe that you should be involved in it, you're disobeying by not doing it. Question number two. How many people have you personally led to Christ? I'm going to expand that. And the reason I'm expanding it is because I'm, I've been thinking. There's Alan Taylor. You led him to Christ. There's Randy your nephew by marriage. And um, I don't I think I think really with Randy anyhow, probably what's going on there more than anything else with the friendship of, of Roger. Um, was really impacting his life and opened him up to the gospel. And I Grace and I haven't talked about that with you so I don't I don't want to say about that, but here's my point. When I'm saying to you how many people have you personally led to Christ, I mean been been involved in. You invited them to church. Can't ever start here tonight, but it seems to go back to Oscar, and uh, Oscar seems to go back to uh, Becky and her husband, and uh, Ro um, you know, I'm drawing blanks. What's his name? <laughs> yes, man. Uh, 
Anyhow, whoever he is, he's married to Becky, and 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 uh, the point that I want you to get is they invited them through through the basketball league. They invited them to come to church, and they got saved. Well, I don't think we've been discipling them. I just love them. I just absolutely love them. I really do. You get really close to people when you meet with them on a regular basis. You study the Word of God together, and you just talk about what you're learning. You begin to open up with all kinds of areas of your life. You just end up falling in love with each other. Again, I want to say this to you. I, I don't want to take away what the Holy Spirit of God is doing, but when I ask you a question like how many people you've been personally involved with, all I'm trying to get you to see is that you need to be involved. That's all. Question number three. As far as you know, how many people have you been instrumental in leading to Christ? And that's covering what I just said. You're inviting people to church. You may have given them a track. God takes all of those things together and puts them together. Uh, Donna oftentimes will say to me, so-and-so uh, came in and asked me to give you a message. I said, really, what was it? They said they saw you on TV and they were commenting on the message. I've really been encouraged by that. That's stuff that I would never know if somebody hadn't told me. And you might think, you know when you preach good message and when you don't. Yeah, I do. But, but I need encouragement just like you do. A Sunday school teacher needs encouragement. Everybody needs encouragement. And the point that I'm trying to make with you is the Word of God is going out. But I think where we're missing the boat is personally, not corporately, but personally, giving it out to people who are coming across day in and day out. And of course, that begins at home uh, more than anywhere else. Uh, the sixth question is, uh, fourth question is, do you give gospel tracts to people regularly, occasionally, or never at all? Uh, Jeremy had some of these made up. And I, this is, uh, I was planning on making some hospital business, so I always carry these with me because it has our picture on the back. And, um, yeah, that's why, because our picture's on the back. And, and uh, it gives ministries, and at times when people come, it has a phone number for where we can be reached. Does it? Yes. It has a phone number for where we can be reached. And it gives them the plan of salvation. There are several other kinds. There's one that's got, that we have that's a green one, a little pamphlet, just very small, and it has a question mark on the front. They don't catch it. Uh, that came from, from uh, Evangelism Explosion down in Florida. And, and there were guys in there, I went down to that one year, and the guys in there had this question mark, where are you going to help in? I was amazed. You walk along in, in, in a mall, this happened to me, I was going to get some cologne, but I didn't bring my cologne with me, so I was going to get some cologne, and, and I walk up, and this lady, she's watching me, I can tell she's watching me, and, and I'm standing there looking at the various kinds, and taking a smell here, and smell there, and she comes over, and she says, all right, you got me. I said, I beg your pardon? She said, you got me. What's, what is that on your lapel? What does that mean? She saw the question mark. And I said, well, here's what it means. If you were to die today, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you would spend eternity in heaven. And, and I'll tell you, a lot of people told me that when they, give, when they have that, that really, Brother Astra always wore a fishing hook. All it was was a little fishing hook. Fishers of men. That's what it was. And you remember how he used to drive that home to us all the time. Don't go out without your fishing hook. And he was great about that himself and, and doing that kind of thing. Do you visit people trying to get them to come to church? Occasionally, never, regularly? Faye, you could say regularly. I know because you're just you're caring for several of the older people. By the way, she looked just great the other day down when I went over to see her. And I'm talking about uh, Marie Faulkner. Got that one. Uh, another question. What is the main reason that you do not participate in evangelizing? Now, again, I, I, I hope you're not sitting there thinking, man, he's just browbeating me. I'm not. I'm really not trying to do that. What is the main reason? I really believe what I said when I started this message. I believe that every single member of this church wants to be active in winning people to Christ. I believe every single one of us would like to do that. Why aren't we doing it then? When you need something to think about. It. Why? Why don't you give a track? Why don't you invite the church? Why, 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 why? Well, let me just give you three possibilities. Uh, I want to tell you these are probably the most popular. Uh, but that comes across in a positive connotation and it's not. Fear of rejection. Have you ever given track to somebody, or have you ever invited somebody to church that they started making fun of you and putting you down? And I'm sure that's happened. Uh, sometimes I get I get warned about not doing certain things to certain people. I hate it when people do that to me. And Grace, you notwithstanding you, I'm thinking about Randy when you said, Boy, I'm about to say, I want you to go make this visit, but he's, he's, he could cuss you out, he could throw you out, and he, I don't know what he's going to do. He didn't do any of that. But she was trying to protect me. That's what she was trying to do. 
Are you, are you have, do you have fear of rejection? Think about that. Because there's a way to overcome that. There really is. I'm, I'm being very sincere. I'll probably have to put it in right now because I'm not sure how far we're going to go with this. But, you know, if, if you are honest with God and you say, Lord, here's my problem. I really do have a fear. Much like I would have a fear if Russ Hagen would call me up there to give a testimony, I would froze up. I just can't do that. And, and I really want to reach out to him. I just can't do that. If you will give, if you will sincerely give that to God, and keep it before God on a regular basis. He'll deal with that. He'll help you. He really will. How about the inability to talk about it? I've had people say this to me. What am I going to do if they start asking me questions? Because I'm, I'm not a debater. I couldn't do it. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now that for me, I am a theologian. That simply means that I've studied my Bible for a long time. And, and you're not going to trip me up in very many places. I know my Bible. And, and, and yet I'm going to tell you that I led more people to Christ when I didn't know my Bible than when I did know my Bible. When I first trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, my mind was not encumbered with all the if, ands, and buts about what's true and what's not true. All I knew was Jesus saved me, I wanted to tell people about it, and I told everybody about it. I, I went to high school the next day. I was a, a junior in high school when I got saved. I had an electric class, which was a vocational class. I was with those guys. Every, all day long except for one period. And, and when I went in there, I started sharing Christ with every one of those guys. And out of 19 guys in that room, I saw 18 of those guys they saved. And I, I could have defended my position if I wanted to. If somebody had challenged me, I had no idea what I would have said. But they saw a change in me, and it gave power to the testimony that I was giving. And they started coming to church with me. In fact, I was, I was brand new with everything. Brother Estraff, he saw, he sees the moment. Uh, and from what I understand later on, all the officers in the church got all over him for doing it, but he did it anyhow. Sorry, guys. Um, he let me drive the Green Briar van, Chevrolet Green Briar van. Because I was filling it up with all my classmates. I'd drive to Norwood from Northern Hills and up by Coleraine, where you were from, and, and I'd fill that little thing up, and we had a great time. Yeah, I burned rubber with it, I'd make it stand on the end. See, the engine was in the back. And man, those guys, as soon as they get to pop the clutch, pop the clutch, and I'd pop it, boy, and it would come up in the front, and we'd squeal tires down the road, and, and uh, he'd call me in his office, and he's, he'd look at me and raise that one eyebrow, and, what have you been doing? I don't know what other people say I'm doing. <laughs> he said, are you recklessly driving? And I said, no, I'm just popping wheelies, is all. He said, can't do that, you're going to get me in trouble. I said, Okay. But you know what? That was, it was just so great on my heart. 17 years old, knew nothing about nothing. Couldn't have, couldn't have told you the books of the Bible. Love that when uh, Matt and Jean first started coming and they said, you're going too fast. I don't know all these books in, in the Bible. Slow down a little bit. I love that. I remember those days. I remember when I led Frank Schwartz to Christ. Actually, what I did was invited him to church and he got saved. And I remember that I, even back then, I had this strong sense he needed to be disciple. He was a Catholic, he wanted to be a Catholic priest. He was a Catholic. And he came forward that Sunday and trusted Jesus Christ as a Savior, so his girlfriend. And, and so the next day at work, I went in there and I said, Listen, I need a disciple you. And he said, What's that? And I said, Well, we're just going to read the Bible and study it together. We got off at 2.30 in the morning uh, from the factory that we both worked at side by side. And as soon as we got done, we go clean up. Then we go, I was living with my mother because we weren't married yet. Uh, we clean up and we go to my room. I go right through my sister's bedroom, which is actually a dining room, which was converted into a bedroom. We cut through that bedroom and we tiptoe, be as quiet as we could be, take our shoes off the door. And we go into my room and we close the door and turn the light on. And I started reading the Gospel of John. And he said, What's that mean? And I said, Well, here's what I think it means. And I told him. I mean, I didn't know hardly anything about anything. But I knew he needed to know whatever I knew. I knew that. Now, I, I'm trying to give you some positive stuff here. Because it still goes on today. It, it really does. I, I, I want to tell you, stop and think about the possibilities of this. If everybody in here discipled one person, you just sat down with them with the Word of God, and you started reading in John chapter 1 and verse 1, and you said to them, here's what I think that means. 
What do you think it means? And then they told you what they thought it meant. You'd be amazed what God would do with that. You would be amazed. He, listen, he's a, he's a missionary. He, he ended up going to England where his wife was from. You know that. We supported him for years. And now he rescues dying churches around America. Actually, this well, I'm going to get in there. Here's the last one. It's probably the most important question of all. Went through all that to this point for this question. Who, who, who is on your heart right now? See, if you're struggling, if a name don't, if a face and a name don't come to your mind, and perhaps a number of them, there's your answer. There's your problem. You know the first one that came to my mind? Joanna. Not you. I have a niece. I've been following her on Facebook. She's a fine young lady. She's had a baby out of wedlock. It's a mixed baby, part black and part white. But she's, how old would you say she is now? Eight or nine years old, something like that? Now, can I tell you what God has been speaking my heart about doing? Inviting her to come down and stay with Don and I for a while. Just visit. And getting her to come to church. Uh, this little girl looks very black. She does. It, it enters your mind. How would the church react? I know how you react. I've seen you. I mean, you do it with the little kids. Like that. That's not an issue here anymore. I can't control everybody, but for the most part, it's not even bothering you. Come on. Who's on your mind right now? You, you need to at least say the name to yourself. Identify it. If there's no name, just say nobody. You see, this is the beginning point. This is where God is going to begin speaking to our hearts and really healing us. Healing us of our introversion. I, I've said this before, and I, I want to be careful how I say it again. Um, I like our church, and I like our church services. I love our choir. I love singing in the choir. It's probably my favorite part of it all besides preaching. Uh, you see how I preach. I never waver from this. I've done this, I guess, for the 30, almost 32 years I've been here. I open my book up, uh, my sermon book up, and I lay it down in front of me, and I might move over here, or I might move over here, but I don't even leave this. I don't really even need a microphone because this one will do just fine. Now, most people don't like that kind of delivery. Most people like the preachers run from one side and they run to the next side and come down here and jump over that pew and scream to the top of their lungs. And, and listen, when Brother Eisenhower gets here, he'll be somewhat like that. You know, he's preached there a number of times. He'll be running back and go, I love it. I, just, I love guys to preach like that. I wish I could preach like that. But if I did, I would forget. I can't remember your names, much less the point that I've got in my message I'm looking next. I love our church like in that way, but I have people say to me, Brother Satan, I don't mean to offend you. I've learned from you. But I like a lot more emotion in church than what Bible Baptist has. I said, Would you explain to me what you mean by that? And they said, Yeah, I like preachers that run around a lot, scream and yell and holler and do all that stuff. I really like that. I said, Well, good, I like it too. I wish I could preach that way. And they say, And nobody says anything in your church. How do you know if they even agree with you? And every now and then you're a bird. And I guess you're saying amen, but I'm not even sure of that. Okay, now let me post something to you. Somebody said that to me. Should we change our church? We'll start appointing guys in every service. Jerry, this coming Sunday morning, you got to be here. And when I start preaching, amen! All right, we can do that. And Darren will follow that up as soon as he hears you say it. And then Frosty, you do it next. Can't you just see Frosty doing that? Now, see, the reason that I'm doing that is because that's not them. And Jerry might be a little bit you. But that's not Frosty. Frosty, I would change you for anything. I love the way you are. He's as deep as they come. He does. Just ask his granddaughter. Daughters. He is. He's a deep guy. Jerry's always saying to me, he's probably my best friend, and he says, you know, he's got so much wisdom. 
When he begins to talk, boy, you just look, he's got so much wisdom. Well, why would we bring somebody like that that God made in a different way and say, I want you to see how real love is right now. Amen! See, I, I, just, I just can't do that. I just can't. Maybe, maybe the day is going to come when I stand before the Lord and He's going to say, Don, you should have been more emotional. Then I'll, I'll look at the Lord and say, forgive me. That's what I'm going to say. And he knows that I sinned out of ignorance if that's what he's going to say to me. But I don't think he is. You know, for all these years, I've tried to teach you one basic thing in a lot of different ways. Rather, a guy runs all over the place and screams at the top of his lungs and jumps over pews and you just love what he's doing. Or rather, a guy's like me, he's tied to the pulpit and he sticks right to his nose. Or, or rather, it's another guy who does it in some other way. But the bottom line is, you want to know what they're saying. Listen, if a guy runs all over the place and I don't know what he's saying, it, it, I don't like his preaching. Period. That's how I am. And if a guy stands there and he weeps and I've got to really listen carefully because in between his words it's hard to figure him out. If he's saying something, I'm going to love him. But I want to know what's being said. Now, there's, I'm getting a little bit off track here. I've only got a few minutes to get this done. The excuses, there's three of them I'm going to give you here. And there's a lot more than these. I think I've captured your attention. And I want you to know that I, I could have had 3,000 excuses because there's that many. As to why we're not in evangelism or not winning people to Christ. But the bottom line is, the three will suffice. We are living in the last days, and in the last days we're told that the hearts of people will be cold. I don't think um, Brother Jeff would mind me saying to you what he said to me. He said, uh, Brother Don, I ask people this all the time. Are you seeing people saved? And, and most preachers that I know will say occasionally. Occasionally. It's been like that for a long, long time. Then you have the, uh, you have the Chris Fugates that are just tearing it up. His brother, I mean, he must run the family. The brother's up there. What's he run? A thousand people or so, something like that. Um, Mark, up here, Mark uh, came from our own church. Mark's up there at Central Baptist Church, gone door to door throughout this entire town. I don't know how many people have led Christ, but it's been a bunch. It's been a bunch. Uh, we can go on and on and on and on and on and on about people, different people, and the different things that they're doing. But living in the last days and hearts being cold has nothing to do with us not evangelizing. God, and I'm going to say this several times, God did not put on us the burden that we have to produce, not, we, let me rephrase it. God does not expect us to bring people to Christ and start counting people. God simply said this when he gave the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Notice he didn't say, go and tell them and see to it that they get saved. And he said God's not going to hold you accountable whether the people are getting saved or not. He's going to hold you accountable whether you're telling people how to be saved or not. And me. So the first one, it has nothing to do. Evangelizing has to do more with our own hearts than it does with the hearts of lost people. With our own hearts. You know, this is so important that we admit these things to each other, to ourselves. That if, if, if you've never led anybody to Christ, if you've never had a desire to lead anybody to Christ, if you've never even thought about leading anybody to Christ, it's imperative that you acknowledge that's a sin. That is a sin. Because then God can heal it. We know what comes next after that, and that is, that is repenting, turning. Number two, I don't have the gift of evangelism. You don't have to have the gift of evangelism. The gift of evangelism simply means that when God gives that gift, you're going to see somebody bringing people to Christ on a very regular basis. That's, they just got that gift. I mean, they're just great. They go out there and they know how to strike up a conversation. I've been told, don't know the guy's name, Jerry Falwell, uh, grew his ministry from zero to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And, and here they are now. His son is the pastor of that church, fifth fastest growing church in America now, even though Jerry Falwell is dead in heaven with the Lord. Uh, his body's dead and he's, he's in heaven with the Lord. And, and, and you, you look at all of those things, you see all those things, and say, wow, man, what great work they did. Do you know the people, guys that I know, and people I don't know, and they come up here and they see this, they say, wow, this, 
It is beautiful, isn't it? We came over faith from where you live. We were trying to avoid all the traffic that's going through town. And we were coming up the hill. And right when we hit the crest of the hill, and you look out over here on the hill, sun was shining bright, right on our... Well, this is a beautiful church. You know, I, I just got to tell you this, and I, don't, I hope it doesn't come across real negative. I, don't, I just don't think we're going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ, which is only for saved people. And he's going to say, Don, Sam... All the officers here in the church. He said, I don't think he's going to say this. Good job, man. That's a beautiful building you built. Oh, it's beautiful. That, that family life center, that was awesome. I don't think he's going to do that. You know, I've heard all my life, God doesn't count how many offerings are there. He doesn't count how many buildings are there. This is about people. It's not about buildings. It's about people. I really fear, and I know that illustration that you gave to start your message, the seacoast. Y'all remember that when we gave that uh, last Wednesday? Remember that? That's an illustration that I've used in a standard message that I preached in every Bible I've ever been in. I had so many people come up to me and say, man, is that, that just depicts us. Oh, man. I pray that doesn't depict us. Did you understand what that illustration was about? That illustration was directed to churches and saying, you've turned into a social club. I'd rather die than that be the case. Maybe this third one, I'm only going to touch on it, then we're going to move on really quick. You don't have time. And, and let me tell you something. Satan doesn't care what the reason is. He just wants to rob us of time. I went to Don and made a couple, Don, made a couple visits. And went over and saw, uh, saw your mom, Sarah, over here at the hospital. Sweet, sweet lady. We went up to, um, we went up to Maria, to the terrace. Visited Marie. Had a great, I just love her. I just, she is one intelligent woman. She really is. Never, she just made such an indelible mark on me when she was attending here. Um, I had a plan today. I intended to be up there with uh, Randy. Taking my Bible. And my son's coming in. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pope. You got my granddaughter to come, so now I'm getting the whole family that's coming in. But uh, Lee, I don't know, is Lisa going to be up or is she going to stay? She'll probably understand. But anyhow, Scott and Christopher are at least going to be going to Belmont. It's Belmont College in Nashville. Does anybody know that? He's saying about going to Belmont College. And they're going to be taking him down there, and the family's going to be staying here, except for you took my granddaughter away. She's staying with you. You know that? You know about this? Okay, all right. She's going to stay with her because that's her best friend. And, and um, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I mean, he's, we're really going to do these things. But uh, what I want you to see is that happened. And what else? There was another. Well, Sandy and Peter are on their way. And they may even be here right now. And you know how it goes. Somebody's going to come on the relative. You've got to clean the whole house. And they haven't understood that. House is never all that dirty. Yeah, it's just me and you. We're not that dirty, are we? Yeah, okay, we are. All right. Um, and and I'm out all day. Not complaining. Great God, they're coming in. Where's my study time going to come for Sunday's message? All the, here's the point I make. I want to see how guilty I am of this. The same thing's for you. Satan will stick anything, anything ahead of bringing people to church and bringing them to Christ. He don't care what it is. That makes a difference to him. Just put something in there that will stop them from what's really important. And we find ourselves doing the urgent and not doing the important. It's got to be repentant. Oh. Now, I'm just going to touch on these things, read you a few of some scripture because it's 10 till one time to pray. The emptiness is my third point. And here's my point about that because I'm telling you what I feel. A void, an emptiness that you feel inside when you're not bringing people to Christ. You feel it inside. It feels like a guilt of sin. When I say unto the wicked man, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require in your hand. Those are the ones that he puts upon your heart, give him a track. I, I know I've played his experience, and I know I have many times. You see him, I don't care if it's a waitress, maybe, maybe a nurse in a hospital, it could be anybody, but God just, you just saw a still small voice in you and said, give, give it to him, give it to him. And you walk away without doing anything at all. 
You know some Every person in here tonight could raise your hand and say, I've done that, because you have. Everyone else. You want to know where our problem's at? That's it. That's it. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. Listen to this. No man cared for my soul. I want to draw you a picture of what's going to happen. The judgment seat of Christ. No. Very white throne of judgment. We're going to have relatives, nieces and nephews, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. And they're going to be cast into hell. It's going to be really, really real to us because we're right there. And whatever that means, and I don't know what it means, but whatever that means, their blood I will require at your hand. The Lord will cast them into hell. I've oftentimes wondered, does that mean that we will cast them into hell? Can you even imagine somebody you love and throwing them into eternal fire? The energy, we've all been called to tell the story and saying is something that only God can do. That's, that's the assurance. That takes all the weight off of us. Or you just said tell, and I'll, I will. I, the least I can do is give a track. The least I can do the guy I've been working with for, for the last 20 years and, and never said a word to him. I had a, a deacon in a church when I was a brand new kid, just right out of high school. I've already told you stories about that. And I got a job at R.K. LeBond, and there I am working right, right next to Frank Schwartz. Turned out that, that that's where they put me at and, and, and there's guys that are working around me, guys coming over to meet me and really being nice to me and all that until they find out I'm a Christian when I began witnessing to them. You go to church anywhere, man, everything changed. Everything changed. We had to change when I did that. I remember a guy that came to me after I'd been there for about two years. I was getting ready to leave. And he came over to me and he said, I just want to apologize to you. And I said, for what? He said, I've made life miserable for you. I've made fun of you for being a witnessing Christian and trying to bring people to Christ. And he said, I'm a deacon in a Baptist church. You didn't even know I was saved, much less a deacon. He said, I'm so ashamed I could die. I said, well, I want to thank you that you at least identified who you are. Thank God. Now, let me ask you a question. Could you, would you have to go to people that you've known for a long time? They don't even know you're a Christian. Could you go to them and say, you know something, I, I have something I need to tell you. I've, I've, done, I've really done something terrible to you, and I'm going to ask you to forgive me. You got their attention now. I'm a Christian, and you probably didn't even know that. And I have failed you by telling you how you can get to heaven. Please forgive me for that. We'll try to correct that in the future. It will touch my heart, I can tell you that. Okay, I'm going to finish, I think, with uh, one of these. I'm going to skip over some, Joe. I'm going to write down that last... Uh... Yeah, I'm going to go right down to the very last. Here's where it's at right now. Well, I, don't, I don't even like reading the scripture. Turn to it in your Bibles. It's up on the screen. Revelation chapter 3, just turn there. This is the answer. Understanding... Revelation 13 and verse 15. You don't have it marked, and you mark your Bible, you all do it. Just draw a big circle around it. I know thy works. You're not cold, and you're not hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. What do you do with you? You make me sick. That's, those, that's in red, means Jesus spoke those words to the church. At Ephesus, the very first one, the very last one, the church at Laodicea, he virtually tells them the same thing. You left your first love, and you become lukewarm. Is that, come on, think with me for just a moment. It's important, I think it's really important for us to know the, the, the times that we live in. Would, would you agree with me and say that, that basically, few exceptions, the Chris, um, Chris a few days and people like that, but a few exceptions... What's going on in America and around the world today, and a lot and a lot part of the world today, is that churches and Christians are lukewarm. Would you agree? We don't hate God. 
And, and you know, I mean, if somebody falls in my lap that doesn't know Jesus, I'll tell them about him. Give them a track, at least. That's about how it is. We're lukewarm. What do you do when you discover you've got a disease? When you discover you've got something wrong, what do you do? Um, I've shown most of you, don't mean to keep talking about it, and when you get old, you love to talk about your illnesses. It's a, just a common thing you have. I've shown most of you this little dot. It's amazing. A little dot on my wrist, and they go all the way through there, up my arm, over into my heart, and take pictures of my heart. That's amazing. It's amazing. Then he wiggles it back out, and he says, now we're going to put this one up here, and he goes in, he puts a stent in there, and opens it up, and then comes back out, and I mean, as soon as it opens up, bam, pain's gone. That fixed. I knew what to do. I went to a couple weeks ago, and I said, uh, Dr. Skinner, I need another stent, and he started laughing. He said, I, I thought I was a doctor here, but now you're the doctor. And I said, oh, I know my body. And my body said, it's sent time. He said, yeah, I think you're probably right. He said, things are abnormal on the tests I've given you. I went, went to alarm about it. He said, you're going to love this. We're going to go through the risk. And he started telling me all about it. I said, I don't think I'm going to say I love it, but I, I'm glad that you have that technology. I've read you what it says, and here's what it says in Revelation 3 and verse 19. Just a few verses later, after he says, you're lukewarm, he goes on to say, As many as I love, I rebuke and I whip them. Be zealous thereof and repent. That's the answer. Okay, how do, you, how do we repent of this? Well, let's all get up here at the altar and get on our knees and say, I'm repenting. It's not the answer. I've seen too many altar calls where people come forward and it means nothing. I've seen it where it means a lot. Here's what you do. When, when God convicts you of a sin, you, know, I see, you say, I see my sin and I name my sin. And I am turning away from it. Now what does that mean in this case? Lord, tomorrow, perhaps even tonight, depending on whether we get frosty or not, we're, we're going to meet some people. We're going to meet them. I'm just going to say to them, hey, I go to Bible Baptist Church. You go to church anywhere? We should come to ours. I'll tell you what, if you come to ours, I'll sit with you. I, I love what you had to say. Just love it. I'm going to say it again. You, t you take a pretty young lady who puts on something like a public stand and says, nothing is more attractive in a boy than when he loves Christ. Man, that would get some dedication fast. What happened to me, isn't it? She made her mind up. Gotta be someone who loves the Lord. Now I need your help on this next one. I have so many wonderful memories of Brother Ashcraft. If I talk about him very much, I want to cry. Not not from sorrow. I just love him. He was my pastor for most of my life. We suffered together. We witnessed together. He taught me a lot. But at his funeral, Brother Head is the one who brought this up. He used to pass here at Central. I preached his funeral, and he wanted me to, he had given instructions to his daughter, I want, I want Don to run the service. And so I said at the end of the service, this is how I will. This is how I will forever remember Brother Ashcraft. A song that we always sing together at the end of our evangelism class. So go ahead, Joe, put it on the screen. It's not up there already. I want you to sing it with me. Here's how it goes. I'll sing it. Lord, put an agony deep in my soul. A yearning for sinners to come be made whole. Burden my heart for the lost in the way. Help me to witness and work while I pray. Let's sing it together, sing it, okay? Come on, when you sing it with me, sing it from your heart. Did you do that? Lord, put an agony deep in my soul. A yearning for sinners to come be made whole.
And then he'd say, go out and put that song in action. And we would. We'd go out from our evangelism class. I couldn't wait to meet somebody to tell them about Jesus. He kept that. He had the ability to keep that fervor inside. Let's pray to God, okay? Uh, Darren, I'm going to have you do if you don't care after this prayer time. Oh, Father, I'm just wore out today because you've worn me out all day. This is not just enough to have a message and put it down on a piece of paper. You've written it in my heart. You've reminded me of things. You've been kind and gentle to me. You have shown me what I need to do. And I believe you've shown our church. Oh, Father, help us not to be condemning of each other. We are all so guilty. And may we faithfully go out from here loving Jesus more than we ever have before and going to the lost that are in our way and tell them about Jesus. Don't have to argue with them. Just tell them. That's all you told us to do. Just tell them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the